Hi everyone. Yeah, no, it's good. Yeah. Hi guys, um, thanks for coming to this afternoon's methodology seminar. So we're welcoming back Dr. Darren Daly, who is the Principal Statistician and Senior Lecturer in the Clinical Research Facility Cork. So today he's going to take us through the use and abuse of p-values, which is obviously a very popular topic. Um, just to let you know, the seminar is being recorded as well, so on the Department of Epidemiology YouTube channel you'll be able to watch this back. Okay, thank you. Thanks Brenda. Uh, nothing scary about that. I, I always advise students, um, if you want to get better at talking in front of people, record yourself until someone wants to record me and then I start to shrivel up into a small ball because uh, of the, the absolute fear, uh, but we'll press on. Uh, I wanted to talk about this topic um, for quite some time, p-values. Um, many of you will know there's a lot going on out there in the world kind of critiquing and, and there has been for, for over a hundred years really about how we use p-values in science as an inferential process. But it's kind of a scary topic to start to talk about because one, I'm not a statistician. Uh, I'm really an applied statistician that kind of came through it kind of through circuitous means. Uh, and two, to some degree, everybody in this room either is or will be or act as their own statistician at some point in time. So you all know what a p-value is. You probably all have used p-values. Many of you have probably used p-values hundreds of times. So it's kind of silly and a bit scary to stand in front of a room full of people and you know, speak from on high about p-values. Right? Um, but at the same time, there's a conflict there because we know there are lots of papers like this and little surveys and, and all kinds of anecdotal evidence that people, including researchers and professors and students and all the rest of it, regularly uh, misinterpret uh, uh, what p-values actually are. And again, people have been talking about this for over 100 years. So where it really came to a head for me, and, and what's kind of motivated doing the talk now, uh, was really this statement that was recently released from the American Statistical Association about p-values. And so for those of you who are going to nod off in about five minutes, if there's one thing I want you to do at the end of this talk, is go and download this paper and have a read. All right, so not only does it have some very important kind of basic things about p-values and inference, it has uh, links to a host of other material where people who have been involved in writing this statement uh, have also written blogs and follow-up pieces and editorials and whatnot, kind of parsing out some of the more specific bits and pieces that obviously we couldn't cover here. Um, and then following on from the AMA or the ASA statement is also this paper that just came out um, on the misinterpretations of p-values in general. And so everything really in the paper, or the, the talk here, is going to be kind of pulled from this material. None of this material that they present is any, anything close to original. It's all been published before and multiple times over the decades, and they note that. Uh, as an epidemiologist, I know I don't recognize everyone in the room, but I have to say as an epidemiologist, uh, at heart, I have a lot of pride in the fact that most of the people on that list are epidemiologists uh, or have been associated with the field of epidemiology for a long time. So anyway, this is a fantastic paper. So going kind of back in time, the statement from the American Statistical Association, uh, which is a rare thing for statisticians to do, to get together and make a statement about anything, right? That never happens, and I'll talk about that a little bit in, in a second, was really partly spurned uh, by this editorial in basic and applied psychology, where the editors essentially banned null hypothesis significant testing from their journal. Right? They said, we're not going to do it anymore, no significance, 0.05, mm -hmm. the end. But then they take a step further and they ban standard errors. And they ban calculation of standard deviations because from that you can get the standard error and from that you can get the p-value and the significance level. And at the end of the day, what they wound up doing, quite intentionally, was they banned all means, well not banned, so they banned those things, but they stopped requiring any means of statistical inference to be included in their papers. And then the statistics world exploded with opinions because this was a radical, radical idea. Now, a lot of people cheered up and down, left, right, and center. This was awesome. You know, Twitter exploded. Those of you know me, I love Twitter. I always have to say that. Um, because leading up to that decision, there were lots of editorials and blog posts and other things, again, kind of re-highlighting all of the problems that are inherent in p-values. And we'll talk about them, you know, briefly. Uh, probably the most important one or most popular one 
uh, was this particular uh, piece written for Nature News uh, by Regina Nuzo, and this is probably still the most looked at post or article on Nature News, uh, with hundreds of thousands of views and all the rest of it, calling out some of the inherent problems with p-values. Um, going on at the same time was the rumblings of a another, yet another reproducibility crisis. Uh, this one in psychology. These come around all the time. We all of a sudden wake up and we say, oh, we're not able to reproduce effects. This was a particularly popular uh, analysis from the Open Science Foundation. They published this in Science. And essentially, in a nutshell, what they found, they went out and they replicated 100 studies in psychology using good methods, supposedly, and high-powered studies. And these are the distribution of p-values in the original published studies, and that's the distribution of p-values in the replications. Now, there's a lot of debate whether this actually reflects a replication crisis or not, a reproducibility crisis, but it definitely drew more attention to the use of p-values and, and more kind of conversation, again, leading to that journal to ban them, leading to the uh, American Statistical Association release a thing. Before that, there was, of course, Enitis' very famous paper about why most research findings were false. So again, this is 2005. More and more, you know, rumblings. And lots of papers kind of along the same vein, to be honest with you. And then historically, does anybody, somebody will know who this is? Yes. Yeah, Fisher. Does anybody know who this is? I know he's upside down. So that's Harold Jeffries, for what it's worth, who is probably the most prominent Bayesian through you know, the, the, the 1900s, the, 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 the mid-20th century. And so leading up to the kind of these debates about p-values is this long-running historical battle between different modes of statistical inference, kind of usually kind of characterized as frequentists versus Bayesians. And that's, some of that debate's gotten very heated. And so literally for a very long time, people have been critiquing p-values. So what is a p-value? Right, you all know what a p-value is, but you're going to have to bear with me. Because there will be five people in here who don't know what a p-value is, and I'm going to let you all off the hook. I will not call on anybody. I will not pick on anybody. I will not point anyone out and ask them to answer a question. All right, so we're all safe. This is a safe place. All right, so we're all feeling, all right. So what is a p-value? So I'm going to run through what it is, and I'll show you, and then I'll run through it again. All right. Now, so the first thing we have to have is we have to have some data. Everybody knows what data is. The second thing we need is a test statistic. And that is something we can calculate from the data that has some kind of scientific meaning to us. So a difference in means would be a test statistic. A proportion would be a test statistic. Importantly, we have to have some kind of statistical model. Now the word model is a kind of very vague thing, but at the very least it's going to include a null hypothesis and it's going to include some assumptions about how our data are generated. Right. Assumptions is a very important word. And from that model, Given the model, and given a test statistic, we can uh, estimate some sampling distribution of that test statistic. Now, we can't do that. Some of you might be able to. But the people that really did this were people like Gossett and Fisher at the turn of the 20th century, who's kind of, I mean, Fisher's supposed mathematical genius was the ability to figure out these sampling distributions from the assumptions that were in front of him. So once he had those sampling distributions, that, like, changed the face of statistics uh, and it's still what we do today, primarily using frequentist statistics. So it's having that sampling distribution that's the real key part. Now, once we have the sampling distribution, we have the test statistics we calculated from our own data, we compare one to the other, and we get a sense of how unusual our result is, given the null model. So let's see that real quick. So this is two sets of data, one and two, on ten observations each. And from that... We can calculate all kinds of nice things like the means, sorry, the means, the variances, the number of observations, and then we can start to ask scientific questions like, are the two samples from different distributions? Or maybe a simpler question to ask that gets to the same point, are the sample means different? And of course, what we're going towards is a t-test here. So a t-test, very excitingly, that's how you calculate it. It's simple math. We could all sit in the room right here, and we could all do this calculation by hand. But we're not going to do that. We have computers, and I'll tell you the answer. That is the value of t from this t statistic. Now, what is t? It, it, in and of itself, it doesn't have a lot of meaning. 
What you need to know about T is what happens when you compare it to students' T distribution. All right, so these figures here are the degrees of freedom which you get essentially from the number of observations in your sample. And that's the only parameter that goes in. That's the only kind of thing that's, uh, that you, you give to the function to give you this curve that's the probability. So when you have a very small number of observations, you get something that kind of looks like a normal curve but is pushed down with fat tails. And as you get more and more observations, it turns into this black curve, which is the normal distribution. Right. Not that exciting, I know. But that's what it is, and it took a genius to figure this out. Now, if we look at the T distribution for our particular study, which is calculated as 2 times n, which is the number of people or observations in one of the groups, uh, minus 2, so 18. This is a T distribution with 18 degrees of freedom. All right. The computer calculates that for you, no problem. And you take your T of 0.895 or whatever it was, and that's where it is. So this is the probability distribution again. So everything here, the whole area, integrates to 1, a probability of 1. So everything to the right of that line, it's 19% of the, of the space. Right? So that's the one-sided p-value. And that's all a p-value is. It's just where <coughs> the test statistic you calculate for an observed set of data ranks onto a distribution based on an assumed model. And if we want two-sided, that's it. <coughs> Importantly, there are, of course, assumptions. And in this particular case, for the, for the, for the, you know, the two-sample t-test with equal variances and equal sample sizes, it's that their outcomes uh, should be normally distributed in the two populations we're sampling from, and that we're sampling uh, independent and identically distributed observations. All right, so very standard stuff, those, those, those assumptions, but they are there. So what does it mean again? Let's get through. We go through it again, observe data, test statistic, the model and its assumptions, get the sampling distribution, calculate the test statistic and relate it to that distribution, and then the p-value gives us the probability of seeing the test statistic at that value or more extreme, given the model and the assumptions. All right, so everybody understood that, right? And everybody knew that before you sat down. I've just wasted like seven minutes of your lives. Everybody totally got that. All right, so let's come back to the ASA statement. Um, just to quickly note that these kinds of statements are very, very rare. So for the ASA to come out and say something in a united voice is an unusual thing. They've only done it, I think, three times. Uh, and the other two are very clearly related to policies that were coming into, into being. Right? And when they wrote this statement, as they, they acknowledge that there were people that not only disagreed, people that helped formulate it, that not only disagreed with it, or rather participated in the process. They not only disagreed with some of it, they disagreed with all of it. Right? So about 25 people involved, and some of them were just adamant that this was the wrong thing to be telling people, period. When this was after over a year-long process. And part of the issue, I think, this is one of my favorite quotes in statistics. There are no routine statistical questions, only questionable statistical routines. You know, there are no absolutes in analysis. There's no one procedure that we're going to get the right answer all the time. So it's kind of the nature of everything. Um, I think that lends itself to it. But the statement is, is this. And there's only there's, there's six points from the statement. And those are going to be in blue, and I just quoted them. And so we can kind of discuss or whatever. So the first is just essentially probably the safest interpretation of what a p-value is. And it's just an indicator of how incompatible your data are with the statistical model. Right? That's the language they landed on. So importantly, what you have to remember is that the term model is a, is a description of the entire process. It's the assumptions. It's the null. So a deviation in significance could reflect you know, poor assumptions. You know, we're getting assumptions wrong, or it could reflect the, uh, a rejection of the null hypothesis. Right? So all of this stuff is kind of mixed together into one thing. So if you, if you keep that in mind, that's kind of the best way to stop from going wrong. Very importantly, um, p-values don't measure the probability that the studied hypothesis is true, false, or anything else. Right? Or that the data were produced by chance alone. So we, we have... The probability of the data given the hypothesis is essentially what the p-value is getting at. It's not the probability of the hypothesis given the data. 
I'll come back to that idea in just a second. The point here is that the null hypothesis is a given, and it's the only one you're talking about. So there's no way a p-value in any way, shape, or form can say anything about the probability of the null hypothesis, the probability of another hypothesis, period. And the second point is that people like to say it's the probability that uh, the data were produced by chance alone. Well, no, they could also be produced by violations of the assumptions that are built into the model. Right? There's lots of other places where this can go wrong, not just a measure of randomness. So some related misconceptions then. So it's not the probability the null is true, which is the point I just made, right? It's not a probability about the null. It's not the probability that chance alone would produce the result. A significant result does not mean the null is false. Again, it just means that the data are incompatible with the null. There could be other hypotheses it's just as incompatible with or more incompatible than. Um, a non-significant result does not mean the null is true. I think people are generally pretty comfortable with that one. Uh, a non-significant result does not mean no association was observed. So this is a really interesting one. All right? So if you get a non-significant result, but you get an effect size of two standard deviations, you didn't see nothing. You saw an effect size of two standard deviations. That hasn't, that hasn't gone away. It's just that what you've seen you know, is, 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 isn't incompatible with the null of no standard deviations, for example. So coming back to this issue of kind of the real challenge of p-values, because you kind of come to the end of this, and you're like, well, if it doesn't say all those things, you know, what on earth does it say? And so this is where we start to veer into Bayesian perspectives on, on inference. So here what we're looking at, we're talking about, uh, usually what we might be more interested in is the probability of the hypothesis given the data, not the probability of the data given the hypothesis. Right? So this is in one of the pieces that was there, and essentially what you say is if I start with some prior idea about how likely the hypothesis is to be true, right? So that's reflected here. It's very unlikely to be true. Lots of yellow uh, coin flip. The prior hypothesis is likely to be true, or very likely, or sorry, likely to be true, and very likely to be untrue. And if we do the study and we get p values of 0.05 or 0.01, or 0.01, then here we can look at the actual chance that there was no real effect. And here you're only going from 11% chance of no real effect to 30% chance of no real effect. All right, 71 to 89, 96, 99. So here, this process, and this is how screening tests work, lots of things, it's really driven by our prior notions of whether the hypothesis is correct or not. All right, and that starts to get to the heart of Bayesian statistics. It all centers around this equation for the most part. There's nothing controversial about this. This is basic probability theory. This is derived from the product sum rules of probability, right? Um, but the point here, if we're interested in the probability of the hypothesis given the data, the tricky bit is this one, the probability of the hypothesis going in. And that's what, what kind of, if you take a frequentist approach, you would say that Fisher and Gossett liberated us from this problem by coming up with all these sampling distributions that we can use in our scientific studies. The Bayesians would say, well, that's crazy. Because Fisher was an experimentalist, he was doing agricultural experiments. It's a, it's a context that a lot of us, you know, particularly in public health and epidemiology and lots of kind of uh, psychology, sociology, we don't really have that kind of setup or that framework. So maybe it doesn't make sense for us at all. But then the trouble here is that the Bayesians fight amongst each other about how this should be done almost as vigorously as they do with the frequentists. Now, in life, this, these kind of lines are all going away. You know, like the world is becoming a more, you know, happy and aggressive place. You know. So hopefully, from a practical standpoint, you know, most people use the tool that's appropriate for the job, and this will include Bayesian perspectives and frequentists. So back to the ASA statement. This is where we start to get into, we're moving from what a p-value is, <coughs> and now this idea that we're going to somehow chop it at some place at 0.05 and start making decisions. Right, so that's a, that's a whole other step in the process, and probably the step that people object to the most. Right, so statisticians will sometimes stand up and they'll say that 0 0.05, where would that come from? Well, you flip a quarter, you get two heads in a row, three heads in a row, four heads in a row, five heads in a row. That's about the time people start to say, you, you're cheating me. Right. So there's really not much more to it than that. This choice of 0 0.05 
is acknowledged as a completely arbitrary thing, really. And there's lots of evidence through simulation, uh, through actual derivation, that a 0.05 p-value is not often strong evidence in favor of anything, right? And the whole point when these things were kind of being created was that this was the, the idea that this was worth a second look if you got a solid p-value of 0.05. You know, it's something that should get your curiosity peaked a little bit. But Fisher would say that the goal isn't to get a significant thing of 0.P05, but it's to be able to reproduce that significant result repeatedly in experiments. Then you know what you're doing. Uh, you, then you know what you're talking about. Right? But we don't really have that possibility in a lot of our research contexts. So the other report, when an epidemiologist said, but pretty good about this one, is that the p-value doesn't measure the size of an effect or the importance of the result. And so again, what happens is people calculate a p-value, and then they dichotomize it in 0.05, and they report whether some effect was significant or not significant. Right? That is the biggest problem we have. Not doing that is where we should, at the very least, you should be avoiding that. And that is because it completely obscures what the actual effect was. And there are lots of papers, some of the We'll review papers, you'll be associate editors, editors, uh, certainly all most of you will be reviewers, and you will see papers that do this. That they, you know, that they don't say anything about what the actual effect size is. Well, that's the most important thing there is. Right, what, what actually happened? And, and, and if you don't give the effect size, then that information's lost to the next people who write a paper. Because two non significant results can often together, use together in conjunction, we represent good evidence against the null, right? Except you can't say good evidence against the null because that's not what a p-value does. See how easy it is to, to kind of fall into that? Importantly, proper inference requires transparency. And so this is getting to the point of p-hacking uh, and file drawer effects and everything else. So what happens is people sit down at their computer, and I've done this, and they start to make decisions. They open a data set. I'm going to categorize this this way. I'm going to divide this by three. I'm going to log transform this. I'm going to look at these four models, throw those four away, look at these three models. OK, that's interesting. And we do this. And it's kind of a natural process. But it's wrong. Right? So the whole inferential procedure relies on being clear and transparent about all of those decisions. Now, if you think about that in practical terms, if you were to go to a journal and say, Okay, so this is what I did. I, Tuesday morning, I came in a little late. Monday, there was a game on. I uh, got a cup of coffee. I sat down. I started doing my analysis. And I made this decision, this decision, and this decision. Well, then, you know, obviously, that's not going to all get published. And even if you did it in some kind of professional, clear way, you know, what you're going to wind up producing, you know, is probably going to be a, a tome in and of itself, right? So the trick there is you've got to be thinking about these things and pre-specifying things before you start the analysis. Just like you know, people are starting to do in clinical trials more, it applies across the board for this reason. Because P.05, when you're kind of going down this garden of forking paths and not telling people the route you took, it doesn't mean the same thing. You've, you've destroyed the inferential procedure. And, and to me, it comes down to this point here, which is when we're doing good science, we, we want to justify the importance of our questions not the importance of our answers based on the data, right? So we should be asking a question because it's an important question to ask in a scientific way, not looking at answers and deciding which of those answers is important, right? That's just, that's kind of where I sit on it. Another quick thing to talk about is, and this was written by Jeffrey Leake and Roger Peng, and they're the editors of Biostatistics now, is that there's this huge focus on p-values and inference, and kind of what I've been saying is this whole process of research that goes on, and then we're not talking about that nearly so much. So if you go back to that Lancer report from a few years ago on research waste, it touches on all this quite a bit more, but it's kind of ridiculous to sit here and just ignore this entire process. Are we getting our data cleaning right? Do we even have the right stuff, the right materials to start off with? And then, but we're, we're arguing about p-values and kind of what are often very trivial differences between methods of, of calculating and making inferences. So then, again, kind of falling from that, again, this ASA statement, this, they've very clearly not done anything radical. Um, a lot of this kind of seems like common sense, but it certainly needs to be said. But a p-value by itself 
is not a good measure of evidence regarding the model or hypothesis. It's just one little piece of the puzzle, so to speak. Like, you as a scientist should be bringing your big brain to the problem at hand, right? And you should be looking at a wide number of kind of relationships and hypotheses and how those fit with an overall theory that you're using to predict observations. It's not, in epidemiology, we have it a little bit trickier because in, in a lot of sciences, you're often focused on the effect of unintervention. And that way we become somewhat atheoretical. We just want to know if I change this, what happens? Right? We're often not trying to predict these kind of large-scale theories of how the universe works. So a few others to add. This is, these are kind of, now we're just into my pet peeves. Yeah, so have fun with that. Um, people submit papers all the time that say the p-values near 0.05 reflect trends. All right, so there's a, there's a great blog, uh, this one, because it's still not significant. Uh, and so what this guy does is he goes out, and other people now help him with this, and they send him examples like these. So essentially what it is, when people get a result that's near 0.05, you know, just on the other side of it, people start to go through all kinds of hand-waving and dancing and whatnot to start to justify the result they've gotten. This list, if you go to this website, you'll scroll for like 20 seconds to get to the bottom. He alphabetizes them. This guy's nuts. But they're hilarious. Like you read through them, they're so funny. But there's this idea over and over and over again that there's some trend when your P doesn't hit 0.05. There's a trend. Stephen Sen quipped this uh, in a story he's talking about as if you were talking to a physician. Well, if it's 0.06 is a trend towards significance and 0.04 a trend towards non-significance. Right? So that in and alone should sort that. And you should all believe me that it's not a good idea to say that. But thankfully, someone did also publish something in the BMJ uh, doing some simulation work looking at this exact idea. And so essentially what this is saying is that if you have uh, a, 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 a non-significant result, what's the probability it's going to be less significant had you collected extra data and added that to your study? Right? So if here it's 100%, so you double your sample size and your p-value is 0.08. So that's kind of the thing where people start to do this, like, oh, it's a trend towards whatever. Mm -hmm. You double your sample size, well, 24% of the time, you're actually going to get a, a less, a larger p-value. Right? It's just nonsense, this idea. So if you do it, park it. All right, so kind of wrapping up. Getting there anyway. Um, there are easy things we could be doing in terms of, of best practices. So the easiest thing to do is to first think, if you're reporting significance levels of 0.05, are you actually testing? Are you actually coming to a situation where if the significance level is above 0.05, I'm going to do something about that, and if it's less than that, I'm going to do something about that? Or do you actually require a decision? And in most instances, most of what we're doing doesn't. All right, so in the clinical trial framework, it makes, it makes a lot more sense to start talking about a, a, a statistically significant result because if the FDA sees two of them in a well-powered study, then they might approve the marketing on a drug. Right? That's a very different thing that if I'm doing a study of growth and I'm looking at the slope parameter of, of infant body fat between birth and three months of age, whether that's significant or not, that's a totally different thing. I'm not rushing off to where I did my study you know, to do anything about that necessarily. It's just a part of you know, the evidence. So one is, do you need to be testing at all? Now, some of the problems here, I say these are the easy things to do. Some of the issues are if you start not including that statement in everybody's paper that testing significance for P.05 and two-tailed, if you don't include that, then some reviewer inevitably comes back to you, you know, and says, well, you didn't put in the sentence about significance being 0.05 and two-tailed. But now you've got the ASA statement uh, and the other paper about misconceptions to point to and say, well, here you go. Sandra Greenland says so. I don't have to do this anymore. Leave me alone, right? So, because I find that very frustrating. Um, so once you've gotten over the hump that you don't need to do no hypothesis significance testing, well now, report exact p-values. You don't need to start categorizing them unless it's .001 or something. And then you can start to say less than. But otherwise, just give the p-value. Number two, that p-value is absolutely pointless as I would hope to have convinced you if you didn't believe it before, if you don't understand what the assumptions are. And this is another problem we have in terms of modeling 
and even just simple things, but certainly more advanced, advanced things, models, is that people don't tell you what the damn model is, right? They don't put the math in. And I'm not a mathematician, but I've never reported a model that I didn't understand what the actual mathematical model was. And you need to share that. And then you need to say what the assumptions that are to make the inferences you're trying to make. And you need to write it in every paper you write. And it's boring, and it's repetitive, and it's what we need to do, right? So epidemiology has been a little ahead on the curve in some ways in moving the next step down, which is to ask that people report uh, effect sizes and confidence intervals. Now, we're not, you know, not a lot of time to talk about confidence intervals, not a lot of time to talk about uh, other Bayesian techniques, so unfortunately I'm not going to. Um, but it's worth noting that, that people seem to have this idea that statistical significance is kind of very clearly divorced from confidence intervals. No, the two are absolutely linked, and many of you will kind of come to that understanding. So there, it's not, the confidence centers aren't without problems, but in relation to kind of p-values and whatnot, they seem to be kind of accepted as a better alternative in most instances. <coughs> in terms of best practices or more questionable best practices and things that are going to be very difficult for people to do, is one is convert to Bayesianism or some flavor of it. Now, the reality there is that in current statistical teaching and training, particularly at the undergraduate and postgraduate level, we don't really teach people Bayesian statistics unless they're going to be a statistician. So then asking a room full of people will go learn about Bayesianism and be Bayesian. It's kind of a ridiculous thing to suggest. And Bayesianism is, is by all accounts, hard. <laughs> and who likes to do hard things? Right? Half the, half the reason why the frequentist won is because frequentist procedures were easy to do. Right? Um, but, at the very least, there are some very good ideas and concepts in Bayesianism that we should all strive to kind of start to, uh, to take on. Mainly, how do we kind of integrate what we already know about the problem into our particular analysis? Because we do bring prior information to almost everything. Right? We're not walking into our analyses completely, you know, uh, completely ignorant of what's going on. And that's essentially what most frequentist procedures kind of also assume. Um, another one, again, is back to this point of really how we think about science. Most people, most PhD students, really, they don't take a philosophy of science course. You know, they don't have Popper by the bedside or whatever. You, know, you kind of have to get old and boring before you start picking those books up and seeing what, what's going on with that stuff. And so we don't all have a very good understanding, you know, of, of, of really the, the point of inference at all, of epistemology, of how we know what we know. And so part of that is just about moving away from this kind of atomized view of I report an association and a p-value and that goes in a paper and that moves on to more integrated pieces of work that are kind of building towards a more complicated answer to an important scientific question, if you know what I mean. So if you think that the drug is going to work, you know, it's not just about, and obviously we don't do just one study, we do do a lot, but it's about tying it all across together. You think there are going to be multiple effects and multiple uh, intermediaries and precursors. You think that there are lots of stuff that's going to be going on. And so the more we can describe that lots of stuff, the better. Um, and then, too, this point about being completely transparent. I, I kind of already touched on it. Um, it's easier said than done, but I think it's the number one kind of way of working. If you build your workflow to, I start from a question, I justify the question, I make my decisions about how I'm going to answer that question. That is all set in stone, done, dusted, someone else has signed off on it, verified, shared, and then you go on. <coughs> then you're safe from a lot of these things anyway. But again, easier said than done. Um, so where are we at? How do, again, how do we fix this problem? And this is how they start the essay statement. And I think it's really telling that we do have this circular problem. So why do so many colleges and grad schools teach this kind of null hypothesis significance testing, P is equal to 0.05? Well, because the professors and the editors and everybody all does that. You know? So why do people all still use P equals 0.05? Well, because that's what we teach everybody in school. So there's got to be a point here. I think what winds up happening is, you know, with any social movement, it's the young people who are expected to carry the burden. But the reality is here, it's going to be on the more senior people who are going to be half the ones that, that, that are starting to kind of recognize the changes that need to happen and helping to guide and encourage and enforce those, 
right? So that when you submit your paper and you say, well, you know, we didn't do post hoc power or, you know, we didn't do this procedure, uh, then, then you don't get a reviewer coming back, well, you need to do that. And you don't have an editor there to say, yeah, that's another, you're, the, 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 the researcher is right, that's a terrible idea. We need the senior people to kind of get, to break this cycle, essentially. Uh, that's my two cents on it anyway. Um, okay, I'll stop talking. Thank you. <laughs>